Yeah, I'll say, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Cook. I'm director of the Africa program here at CSIS. Um, we're going to get started because we, we do have to end on time, but I know a, a number more people will be joining us. I think uh, we'll let them trickle in and, and catch up on their own. Um, uh, T today, uh, we're having the official launch of a project, a year-long project that CSIS is, is uh, hosting on um, strengthening support, U.S. support for police reform in Africa in particular. Um, this is um, our, our premise in this uh, is that uh, policing and police reform as a component of the broader security sector reform have been largely uh, neglected and under-resourced in Africa, uh, both by African national governments and by the U.S. governments and the broader international community. Um, second, that many of Africa's current and emergency, emerging security challenge are probably more appropriately dressed by accountable professional police forces than they are uh, by uh, military forces, although uh, military responses tend to be the default response in many of these, in these cases. Um, third is that uh, accountable competent police forces uh, linked to functional judiciary systems are critical elements in democratic con consolidation, post-conflict reconstruction, reconstruction and reconciliation, uh, and so forth. Um, fourth, while the U.S. has provided increasing attention in Africa um, to military engagement with the establishment of AFRICOM and so forth, training and support uh, for police reform has remained fairly disjointed underfunded, um, hangs, hamstrung by kind of uh, enduring legal constraints, and lacking a real uh, strategic focus or profile, I think. Um, and I, I think there's perhaps a concern that the advent of AFRICOM continues to kind of reinforce this preferential uh, tr uh, approach towards um, the military and, and uh, to preference military responses over, again, um, policing solutions to the continent's problems. Um, and, and at the same time, though, there remains, with, with the advent of AFRICOM, there remains a lot of uncertainty about where kind of ultimate responsibility and, and oversight for policing programs will reside uh, within the U.S. government. Our, our hope is that, the, you know, this has been a problem that people have acknowledged for decades, um, but the, the response that you often get is, it's very important, but it's, it's just too hard. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, our hope is that uh, this takes adva advantage of a kind of a shifting understanding of security challenges in Africa. Um, it takes uh, advantage of kind of a new uh, a new administration that I think is still trying to, trying to grapple how it engages with the continent and how it balances um, the various three D's of development, democracy, and, and diplomacy. Um, and it comes at a time when this broader rethinking of how the U.S. might do foreign assistance in, in Africa. There's the QDDR uh, the, um, within the State Department. Uh, the NSC initiative that's looking at security and development issues. There's a the congressional effort to rewrite the Foreign Assistance Act. We, that may, may come in, in a decade or so. But uh, there is a moment, it seems here, that uh, it, it would be important to profile the issue to be able to say something and to be able to put forward some uh, kind of succinct, feasible recommendations at this particular time. We're not trying to uh, produce great, you know, original new thought because there, there has been a great deal done on this in Washington and around town. We've got two of the longstanding experts here with us. Uh, Bob Perito couldn't come today, but that's another person who comes to mind as someone who's worked on this for such a very long time. But what we do hope to do is kind of tackle one by one some of the obstacles um, the, the legal obstacles, the programmatic obstacles, the political will uh, challenge working in, in African governments to, to, um, to, again, kind of bring expertise, 
and say something succinct at this kind of opportune moment um, uh, within to, to the U.S. government, to Congress, and so forth. Um, it's uh, the, how we do police reform is incredibly complex. We, we found out, and, and Richard Downey, a fellow um, here, is, is has been doing a, a range of uh, interviews along with Brian Kennedy and. Um, Alex Snyder, who are working with the Africa program. Um, it's very hard to map out exactly what we are doing uh, in order to say how we might improve it. Uh, and uh, our, our hope is that we, we can at least provide that baseline picture of what, what is happening now and where the room for improvement might lie. Um, we wanted to open up today with, as I said, two longstanding experts on the issue. Um, to kind of help frame, help us frame it. I don't think your work has been so specifically focused on Africa, at least in, in your case, um, Dr. Bailey, but, but kind of on the, on the broader themes of, of reform and police reform. Um, but I think that's important to start with that much, that, that bigger, broader context picture. So um, we're going to turn first to um, uh, David Bailey. I don't think you are. Aren't you going to do? I think you're going to do like. Oh, okay. My, okay. All right. Oops. Okay. <laughs> we're flexible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to start with you, um, Michael Burkow, who is president of Altegrity Security Consulting currently. Uh, this is a, a, a consulting firm that provides uh, product services and solutions, including training, uh, information, and consulting to law enforcement agencies and the federal government. Um, but Mr. Burkow has a long career in policing, is chief of the Savannah Police, uh, deputy uh, chief of the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, yeah, I won't go through the whole list yeah. because it's all over the place. Uh, and has, uh, and I, I think has been extremely useful to, to us as we've been um, preparing for this. Uh, I'll turn to you first and then I'll turn to um, Dr. Bailey, who is distinguished professor uh, in the School of Criminology at SUNY Albany. Uh, he's written uh, a number of books on the topic, Police for the Future, back in the 90s, What Works in Policing, uh, Changing the Guard, that's de uh, developing democratic police approaches, and most recently with Bob Perito, uh, The Police in War. I wish I had a copy I could hold up of the book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fighting Insurgency, Terrorism, and Violent Crime. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. And there's order forms at the back of the room. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, so throughout the course of this, we'll be holding a series, kind of unpackaging um, kind of the legal aspects, the programmatic aspects, the international um, component, and, and perhaps get some folks down from the UN as well. Um, we'll try to keep this on a regular schedule. Um, we'd like to get a, a, a kind of a draft of recommendations out early in the fall that we can vet around uh, for final. Um, uh, final uh, publication in late um, in, in late 2010. Um, we're also trying to be opportunistic in bringing African voices here uh, from Kenya, from Nigeria, Liberia, and South Africa. Those are kind of our focus countries in, in terms of potential case studies um, to talk about kind of what their what their plans and what their experiences are on the ground. Um, with that, I will turn to Mike. Um, it always feels a little strange for me. I've been in the private sector for about four months. So a 30-plus year career in policing, and it, I, I, uh, I lost my first name long ago. I've been a chief of police for 14 years in different departments, and so I haven't been called Mr. Burko. I started looking around for my dad, um, but he was a doctor. So. Um, and the company that I'm working for is, uh, the CEO is Mike Chikaski, who's a former prosecutor um, and has quite extensive reputation. He was the monitor for the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, and my boss, my immediate boss, is Bill Bratton, who was the chief of police in New York and in Los Angeles. And uh, we're obviously involved in a lot of international work. Um, and I'm a proud, I think there's some ISATAP folks here, uh, but I was a, I'm a proud alumni of ISATAP. Uh, back in 1993, I was hired by Chris Kriskovich, um, who the day after he met me sent me to Haiti. Um, and the day I met Bob Perito, he sent me to Mogadishu for a year, I might add. Um, so I, I've had, a, and, I've, and I've continued to do a lot of international police work, uh, short-term missions uh, all over. And I was asked 
by Richard uh, and Jennifer to speak a little bit about Africa, and I'm, I have to <coughs> some context to my remarks and make a few broader comments, and I'm going to use a PowerPoint. Um, I don't know what the best seating arrangement for everyone is. Am I, am I all right where I'm at? I'm a Okay. Um, it seems to me that when you talk about international policing and police assistance from the United States, the first thing you have to realize is everything's done on a continuum. Um, we're providing police assistance to, we, we talk a lot about Afghanistan and Haiti and the failed state sort of model, but we're also providing police assistance in a lot of places that aren't failed states. So, you know, we go down to Costa Rica and we go to, you know, Chile and we do a number of uh, countries where we're providing police assistance in uh, fairly well operating police departments. Somewhere in the middle there are uh, a whole wide variety. So we provide help for Jamaica, you know, for example. And you can go to these police departments. I've done a lot of work with the Jamaican police. You know, we could, at 11.30 at night, we could go to a police station. There would be a group of police officers standing up, standing roll call. They'd go out and get in a car. Um, if you dial 999, you'd get a police dispatcher and you could get the police sent. Um, I think you also need to overlay over this what we're now talking in terms of permissive and non-permissive environments and what David just wrote about um, in terms of working in times of war. Um, really, Somalia was one of the first times where we tried to do that, where we tried to reestablish a police force in the midst of a conflict. Um, and it truly was the midst of a conflict, which brings about a whole different set of issues. When my cops in Mogadishu came to me and said, we want rocket-propelled grenade launchers, um, it was like, wait a minute, that's really not a police weapon. You know, the, the, the concept of collateral damage is a military concept, not a police concept. So you have to overlay that reality when you're thinking about where in the continuum you're providing assistance and how you do that. And I think um, when you're talking about these states, particularly when you're talking about, and we do spend most of our time talking about the failed states, what we've come to recognize over time is we really got to get involved with the entire criminal justice system, and it's not sufficient to just do police redevelopment and police rebuilding. You know, and we should have learned that long ago. We're slow learners in some ways, I think. Um, you know, I remember in Somalia, you know, we, we arrested people and said, where do you take them? And the first jail in Somalia was a 40-foot shipping connex with holes cut in the side for ventilation. Uh, and I remember in Haiti asking for prison advisors and legal advisors and, you know, Carl Alexander showing up in Haiti uh, in the early days, uh, you know, to try and start, start some of that process. Um, and it's fascinating to me how these issues repeat. That'll be part of my, my comments will be the issues repeat. The questions that we're wrestling with in Afghanistan right now, what law to apply, okay, are exactly the same issues we wrestled with in the past in places like Somalia. In Somalia, we had some places they applied the traditional elder rules. You killed my brother, the elders would get together, that's 15 camels, and they'd work it out. Some places they applied Sharia law, Islamic law. Uh, and in 1962, some American, as a Peace Corps volunteer in Somalia, had written a classic U.S. penal code. And that was running around Somalia, too. And in some places, they were actually pulling out the old blue and white penal code book and trying to do more western kind of charging. So these issues we've recognized, we've got to have a broader approach. Um, I think regardless of where you are in the continuum, uh, you've, all, you've got to think about them in a similar way. And, and I would suggest to you that really this is what we've got to talk about and, and where you are and what country you are becomes irrelevant. This becomes a framework that you use. And I think, really, we have to be acutely sensitive to the local cultures. Uh, I've seen us repeatedly try and export U.S. policing, and I'm not even sure what that is after 30-some years in the business. Uh, I've become convinced it's absolutely leader-centric. Um, police departments change depending on who's the chief, um, and they're radically different depending on the parts of the country. I went from LAPD a very storied PD, a very, uh, you know, truly one of the great international police departments, had our bumps in the road at times, but truly an outstanding police department, to, to the Deep South. Um, totally different tradition of policing, different tactics, different strategies, different philosophies. Um, so I think you have to pay attention, not just to the country, but in our country, where, where, where you're actually practicing policing. Um, 
you have to pay attention to the values and the ethics and this concept we throw out of rule of law. The only place that I'm aware of, and it may have happened elsewhere, but David Bailey was brought to Bosnia by Bob Wasserman and wrote uh, a, a democratic framework for the police to follow. Um, and I, I think that was hugely useful, um, although controversial at the time. I totally ignore it. Um, which, sort of, not uncommon. Um, and, um, and then I think these other things are things you've got to have. And we spend an over amount of time thinking about uh, logistics. I mean, and logistics are key, and I, I'll make that point even stronger in a second, but I, I think those all have to underlay these other pr core principles. Um, this has way too much text. Uh, I, I'll just, I, I've seen us repeatedly fail to pay attention to local culture. I think we've done it again in Iraq. You know, we built sort of, we didn't pay attention to the history and we built police forces um, based on, you know, we're going to have a highway patrol because we have highway patrol in America. You know, we, we didn't really think it through. Um, in some places, and I think it's critical that we really start to pay attention to the local realities. Um, I also really think that it's very much about the concepts and the, and the reality of policing operational realities and not training. We spend a huge amount of time focusing on training. Training is a tactic. It's easy to measure. Seats on butts times hours, you know, butts on butts in seats times hours. So it's really easy for us to say we have delivered X number of hours to X number of people in this course. But th there's a whole different thing about knowledge transfer, and there's a whole different discussion about what's the environment into which you've put your trained individual. Can they operate in that environment? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically when I get to uh, Africa. I'll, I'll put some slides up. I was in Afghanistan and. On, in December, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably use that as a more recent example. Um, and I think even with all of our focus on training, and we've done a lot of training, we've trained lots and lots and lots of police officers all over the world. And I, I would argue to you, ISITAP in particular is very, very good at it. We train a lot of people. I'm not sure if you get at the 50,000 foot level, you can really tell that. Um, and even in the training, there isn't a lot of agreed curriculum and what's the policing doctrine? I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been involved in these multinational things. So we get to Haiti, we used to have these massive food fights at the police academy. The French police were absolutely certain they knew it was best. Um, you haven't really had a fight until you've dealt with an RCMP guy from Quebec. <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, so you have this whole argument. What's acceptable police doctrine? What should we be training? How do you talk to someone about clearing a room or stopping a car? Or how do you approach an individual? There isn't clear doctrine, and so there, you get into these kinds of discussions, and that, that's somewhat been lost in the uh, focus on training, training, training. Training can be a driver. Training can be a key tool that a chief can use to transform an organization. But by itself, it's very transitory and limited effects. Um, I would also say logistics. Uh, and I'll mention this, and I'll just, uh, a Somali story is worthwhile. Um, we had a great logistical tale in Somalia. Um, ISATAP, we were there on the ground. Um, we were there after the US troops left. Um, the UN had a bunch of police trainers there but they didn't have a textbook, they didn't have a table, they didn't have a facility, they had no money to do it. And so what we did was we built that stuff and we partnered with them and got them involved. You've got to have logistics to get this. And one of the reasons, particularly in the failed states, that the military plays such a huge role is they're the only ones that have the capacity. They have the surge capacity. They have the helicopters and the generators and the life support and they can get anywhere in a big way. And so they drive many of these missions, which can be very problematic in some way. You know, I, I've partnered with the military many times, but oftentimes they view police as an exit strategy. And, and I think now they're really starting to understand building a police force is fundamentally different and requires a different set of time and skill. Um, so if I can go to Africa, where I've been asked to talk about, um, first of all, I'm not going to talk about all of the U.S. imposed obstacles. I'm going to leave that for Dr. Bailey, who's written books about it 
And um, so I, I will leave the, the discussion of what the U.S. government is doing or should be doing for someone else. Um, I will say that when we talk about Africa and we talk about developing countries, we've got to remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and I was struck by this in Afghanistan in December. You know, we're talking about how to deliver high-level training and, you know, there were some interesting discussions, but these guys aren't getting paid. Or, by the way, they're being put into a neighborhood where they can't get food, and even if they got paid, the local population won't sell them the food. Well, before you can really worry about what kind of policing they're doing, you can, they they got to survive. Um, so you absolutely have to keep in mind, you know, Maslow's hierarchy needs. We've got to deal with basic human needs before we get to some of these other higher level issues. And I think sometimes we fail to do that. Um, I think the other thing in Africa that's absolutely critical is to pay attention to the history. The colonial history plays an, a, a critical role in the police forces today and what their traditions are. Um, and, and you can see that in the different police departments. I've trained you know, in Tanzania, in, in Yemen, uh, in Botswana, in Kenya, and you can really see the roots. You know, they're more British than the British in certain ways. Uh, you, you know, Somalia, which had Italian influences and West German influences and British influences. Again, we have to be very mindful of what were their backgrounds and their roots. And I think when you think about specific places, they are going to be specific issues that are unique to those countries. This is from Afghanistan. One of the things that I had never dealt with in my career, internationally or domestically, was the issue of sexual abuse within the police force, which is absolutely an issue in the uh, Afghanistan National Police. And, and drug-addicted police officers in the 25 to 35 percent range. So unique set of issues in each country, and as you're developing whatever kind of police assistance you're developing, you've got to be mindful of that and take that into account. In Somalia, which is part of Africa, um, you know, we think of the technicals and the, the chaos. What we don't realize is, if you go back in history, in 1964, the Somali police were the finest police in Africa. And I have a copy of the Somali police yearbook from 1964. If you dialed 991 in Somalia in 1964, two Somali cops showed up in a Volkswagen Beetle with a blue light on the top. And they had a forensic lab, and they had a SWAT team called Darwishta, and they had an aviation unit made up of Piper Cubs, and they had a police academy, and they had found a way to operate in a clan-based society where everything is based on the six primary clans, and they had found a way that they were the only institution of government that operated clan neutral. They could send a D, uh, uh, an ESOC policeman to a Darude neighborhood, and he could work. And how did they do that? Well. They've had their own police hospital. They had their own police school. They had their own police orphanage. They built their whole infrastructure so that they could remain neutral. And by the way, they had a reputation for no corruption and no brutality. Now, obviously that has changed over time, but when you think about the effort, the U.S. effort in 1994 to rebuild them, that was actually pretty easy. They wanted to come back to work. And they wanted to be what they once were. We have to be very mindful of the realities of the countries that we're operating in and the police forces we're operating in and the various cultural aspects of them. And Somalia, to me, is a great example. It's where I truly learned about values. Um, when I think about policing and obstacles to international policing, I'm not sure that the issues in Africa are that much different from anywhere else. Um, in every place, you confront issues of corruption. Um, they depend, they can differ by degree, they differ by format, they differ by how they're manifested. They can be high-level corruption where people at the top of the organization are taking big kickbacks and contracts, et cetera. Or they can be relatively low-level where the police officers are extorting a couple of dollars on the corner. And we could have an interesting discussion about what is more corrosive on the public trust and the ability of the police force to operate. Um, the incompetence of the police, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but critical to all of this is the willingness of the host nation. Uh, what does the host country want to do? 
you know, we can go in and say, we want to do this, and we want to help you do A, B, C, D. If the host country is not really interested in that, then you're not going to get very far. And efforts at police reform are not going to be terribly successful. One of the things that I was very pleased with in Somalia is we were running the police program. State Department was very clear that they had broader political objectives. And th there were a number of times where they said, you know, we're going to stop the police program if ABC doesn't happen. Um, and I think that's a critical recognition of our power versus the host country and how you work together and what are you trying to accomplish. Um, I think one of the things that happens in Africa is there are political structures and power structures in Africa that we've really never penetrated. And we have to recognize the reality that reforming the police is frankly a threat to those political structures. Um, and though that reality makes it very difficult to do police reform and police development. Um, I always hear about political will. Um, and sometimes you know, political will is, is uh, not, not really there in the host country in any meaningful way. Um, I think what we try and do is on the bottom. We've done an awful lot of police assistance that focuses on improving skills and knowledge. Um, but does that take and hold? Do we really have knowledge transfer? And I've seen a lot of dysfunction in a lot of these police departments. And the dysfunction in some places is so great in the, in the agency that it becomes almost impossible to engage in the, the skill transfer and the knowledge transfer until you address some of those broader issues. I will, this is a slide actually that I use in training in the US because the way you get a police department to do something, you start with a written policy. What do I want you to do? You know, if you, if you read the Google clips today, you'll see the Milwaukee police change their pursuit policy. Ed Flynn wrote a new policy and said, here's how I want you to do pursuits. Well, once you do that, then you train everybody on what you want them to do and how you want them to do it. We have a tendency to do the training part and skip the policy part. And once you put in place that training and the policy, then you've got to have a supervision system to make sure that people are actually doing it. And finally, there's got to be some kind of a disciplinary system to make sure that it actually happens. And I don't care if you're talking about the LAPD, the Savannah Metro Police Department. My first police department was Coachella, California, 29 cops. You've got to have a, a set of systems in place to drive behavior. Um, and I think that applies whether we're talking about Africa or the United States or any place else. Um, finally, one of the things that I found very interesting in Africa, I've, I've seen this elsewhere, but more pronounced in Africa in my experience, is people hold on to their old doctrine. Um, and I don't know why this is, but I, I ran into a lot of people there who were trained in North Korea or, or, or had North Korean police training and a lot of Russian police training um, in parts of Africa. Um, and we tend to forget that. Um, in Afghanistan, I met the general who was in charge of police training for the entire Afghan police. Well, you know, 20 years ago, this guy went for a four-year police training tour in Moscow. Um, that's where he got his substantive training. So we, we sometimes ha have leaders that are hanging on to their old doctrine. And by the way, this isn't unique to Africa. That's why I'm saying I started with I'm not sure the problems in Africa are any different than they are anywhere else. I could make the same discussion about some chiefs I've worked for in the United States. You know, they're holding on to the doctrine that they might have learned in the, in the early 70s and haven't really changed. Um, so these are just some points that I would make. I don't think Africa is unique in some ways. It certainly is unique in other ways. You have to apply specific experience, knowledge, and respect for the history and customs and culture of the host country. And those have to be embedded throughout this. Um, a, re a real sense of the reality about those host nations. I'll tell one story and then I'm done. Um, when I was in Haiti, we had a big food fight uh, in Haiti. I was in Haiti and I got a call from the State Department and they said, what kind of trucks do you want for the police? You know, Fords or Chevys? And um, if you go behind a police station in Haiti, you can tell what year a country was giving aid to Haiti by the fleet of wrecked vehicles. So the Renault from the 40s, the Canadian Ford Fairlane from the 50s, you know. So, and we had a real discussion. What is the capacity to maintain that kind of assistance? And really, how do we build that capacity into the police force? 
Um, and I think that kind of discussion is absolutely critical as we move forward and, and now really move into something, and it's probably a good segue, we're all talking about security sector reform, which acknowledges the complexity of what we're talking about. And with that? Thank you so much. Yes, why don't we turn directly to you? And Uh, okay, it's on. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do today in, in a few minutes, about 20 minutes, is to talk about the substance of what I think reform should look like uh, in Africa. Um, I'm not going to talk, uh, contrary to what I, either Jennifer or, or Mike said, I'm not going to talk about the bureaucratic obstacles in the U.S. government <laughs> to getting it done. If I do that, we will all be in tears. Uh, and I've been down that road too often. We're not going to do that. What I'm going to give you is eight points, which I think must be borne in mind if you're framing a, a, a reform program, not only for Africa, although I'll comment on Africa specifically, but in general. My first point is you have to decide first what your reform objective is. Capacity building, by the way, is not an objective. It is a means to an end. And what we've got to stop talking about is we're going to do reform or we're going to do capacity building. We've got to say, what's the end state? of that police force that we want to achieve. And I will suggest to you uh, uh, that there are three objectives that you can have in reforming or in supporting a police force. First, do you want to enhance its ability to protect the regime, its ability to protect the population, or its ability to help us with our international security problems? These are fundamental choices. Now, they interrelate to some extent. But there is enormous tension. You can, you can put together a very different program for enhancing the capacity of the police to defend the regime from its internal enemies, as opposed to protecting the population from the things that matter to them in terms of security. And what we often do in all of these countries is what we're really interested in doing is creating international partners in the war on drugs, terrorism, international property rights, trafficking in people, and so forth. Now, look, these are all worthy goals. I don't mean to say you can ignore any of these, but you better get your priorities straight, or you don't know what you're doing there. And, what, and even worse than that, it's so open-ended that everybody will treat it kind of like a Rorschach test, and they'll just feed in the stuff that they already do without any sense of connection to where you want to go. That's my first point. Secondly, my own, and here I'm going to go into to talk about what I think our, our priorities ought to be in Africa as well as in elsewhere, we ought to choose the second. We ought to prioritize developing the police to provide a service that is valued in terms of public safety to the population. Why do I say that? I say that for two reasons. First of all, being protected, an individual being protected in their life and property is fundamental to any kind of development that you're going to do in that. If you ignore this, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're just going to, you're going to waste money. That's first. But the second has to do with America's political objectives in the long term abroad. And surely that is to create stable governments that are based on legitimacy and not on force. This is our democratic aspiration for countries. But it also means, it also uh, is based on, on, on the insight that a country, that a regime, a government, it will, will protect itself better if the public believes that it is valuable and on their side, rather than if it relies on force. So I go for the second. Now let me say something about that, however. Um, it's unrealistic. Let's be, re uh, let is, let's be sensible for a moment. The host government is going to demand something. And they may not be so keen on creating a population-serving police force as we might be. You're going to have to give them something. And you're probably going to, and that's a negotiation, that you better get up front and better be prepared for. If you're not, you're, 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 you're up a creek without a paddle. Second thing is I do think, and here people from the State Department won't particularly appreciate this, I think we ought to ignore America's security agenda. I think, look, international crime in the, in the dimensions that I suggested, drugs, people, uh, terrorism, and so forth, those are serious problems. But I think our, uh, what, we should be, uh, what we should be privileging, prioritizing in these countries is not how they help us, but what we do to create, in the long term, stable, legitimate governments there. 
Uh, and I think we are often too preoccupied with our own short-term problems rather than long-term problems. But this is me, this is Bailey speaking, number, number two, um, uh, in, in point number two. Uh, at the same time, let me say this. This is a problem that all of our, I think that all of our uh, assistance program with the police have, let me put it this way, we have to have negotiations within the American government with respect to getting our priorities right. And the problem at the moment is, as I see it, that the Hill is very interested in developing foreign police sources for our sake. And that's a huge problem. In other words, the money, in other words, we're going to have to pay something to please our political masters in the United States in all of these programs. And so there's, there's a negotiation that has to take place in the host government with respect to that objective and our government <laughs> with respect to why we're there. Uh, and, and getting these on the table earlier rather than later, I think, is fundamental. People come to this debate with different agendas, and you have to recognize that, and you have to get it kind of worked out in advance. All right, third point. Um, um, if, if you, if you uh, want to go with, uh, with any agenda, but particularly the one that I think should be prioritized, which is creating a police force which is perceived to be legitimate through service to its own population, then, then you can do your assessment of your country program. I am suggesting that you've got to get your policy and your political uh, priorities straight first. Then you do the assessment on a country-by-country -country basis. This is just what Mike said. Uh, Africa is a huge place. Uh, and it has different police traditions, different cultures, etc. At that point, you send your team into the country and say, for our particular objectives, what needs to be done and what are the obstacles in each country that needs to be overcome? There is not a generic police reform program for Africa. Forget it. And yet there is the way people talk here in the United States. And it's just terribly naive. Uh, the implication of that, by the way, is that, uh, that I, is that there really is, we have to avoid a cookie cutter approach, which means that we have a lot of programs that we call reform and we just trot them out. We take them off the shelf and we send them every place, the same damn program in country after country after country. We've got to stop that. And we have to assess first and then we have to tailor what we, what we can do to what we need to do. And unfortunately, we don't do that. We send what we do rather than what is needed. The uh, uh, fourth program, if we're going to prioritize the creation of a population serving police that is legitimate in the eyes of its people, provides public safety, how do we do that? What are the keys to doing that particular, uh, uh, achieving that particular objective? In my view, what you need to do is to change the orientation of the police with respect to whom they serve and how they go about it. It is a matter of changing the attitudes of the police. I think three attitudes are absolutely fundamental if you're going to create a population serving police. And Bob Perito and I have recently been writing about this. We call it core policing. We think it has three aspects. The police need to be available to all the citizens. They need to be responsive when called to respond in terms that, are, uh, that reflect the needs that they've been told about. And thirdly, they need to do this policing in a fair, equitable way across all the divisions of society. These are attitudes. Please note, uh, well, let me, say, let me put this first. I think America very often in its foreign assistance programs forgets what made Western and American and Canadian and British and Australian policing really good and was the big transformation. It wasn't technology. It wasn't really a kind of technical knowledge. It wasn't machines. It was, in fact, what Peel said originally, that the police are the, 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 police are the, are, are the, are the, are the, are the people and the people are the police. That was, that's, that's something that goes on in your head. It's not something, it's not a machine. It isn't entirely logistics, which isn't to say logistics aren't important, Mike. They are. They can be crucially important. But you've got to look at what you're trying to do. And what you're trying to do is to change what the police think they're there for. 
And what I'm saying is fund should be fundamental to our uh, assistance program is to teaching them how to be available. So many police, just as you know, stay in their, you know, stay in their police stations. They don't go out. They stay on street corners, et cetera, et cetera. They're not available. And the last thing people, police are going to do is, or people are going to do is come to them. Thirdly, they don't know what to do when they get there either. They don't know how to listen. They don't know how to interact. They don't know how to refer people to other people that can help them. They don't know how to say no in a diplomatic way, et cetera. And lastly, being fair. In other words, this is a public good I'm talking about. And it should be provided equally to everybody, regardless of caste, language, gender, religion, and so forth. That's another thing that happens up here. So what I, and, and so, well, and an implication of this, wherever I go in, in, the, in the police advising business, I find that there is a tension in police, professional police circles, between those people who say, we need, we need to be authoritative and tough to make them respect us. And then what America keeps talking about in terms of human rights and rule of law and all of that soft stuff. And it seems to be a trade-off. And what I want to tell you is I don't think it is a trade-off. And Mike is shaking his head in agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, and the point is this. I think one of the things that we've learned in the recent examination of counterinsurgency doctrine, in counterterrorism doctrine, and something we've known all the way along in, in crime prevention, Get the public on your side, and the police and, and the police can be effective. If the police are not on your side, it's pretty hopeless. Don't we know that fundamentally? So what I'm suggesting is that what you must do is to do those things that show the police in a way which is respected, provides a service that people will say, this is in our benefit. If you do that, uh, if you do that, the effectiveness of the police is multiplied. And I'll put it, my implication is this, that, the, that the, the greatest, if you want to improve the effectiveness of the police, whether it's in crime prevention or in other, preventing these other sorts of things that I've mentioned, the greatest effectiveness multiplier is getting the public to cooperate with you. More important than anything else that you can do. And that's why I stress this business of attitudes. Fifth. The next thing that I would ask of a police, besides working on these attitudes, if, if your priorities are my priorities, is to develop the institutional ability of the police to get value for money. And what I mean here is that most police forces, and sadly this is somewhat true in the United States, uh, Mike, uh, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how they're, they, put it this way. They, they don't know how their money is being spent. They don't know what their people are doing. They don't know how many people are doing one thing as opposed to other things. And they have absolutely no idea what all these people are achieving. What I'm talking about is something which in police circles now is called evidence-based policing. Getting them the ability to collect information about what their organization is doing and more than that, what it's achieving. And what it's achieving in terms of the objectives, the priorities that I already said. In other words, I think we need to develop, and I don't care where you are in the world, you need to develop a kind of problem-solving mentality in the police. So, you, so the police are used to saying, this is our problem. And we will now begin to think and strategize about how to do this. Most police forces, again, in, in developed as underdeveloped countries, in a sense, uh, they police in a, in a generic way. And they police in the same way everywhere and all through the week and so forth. They do not tailor their, the use of their resources to their particular problems. And what I'm suggesting is that this is a capacity that we can develop in foreign police forces as we are learning to develop in our own. And it is fundamental because if you don't do it, resources are being wasted. They're being sent out there by recipe and not because anybody really knows that doing this kind of thing will produce the thing that you want. Six, select and train the donors and project managers that you send out in the field in the skills of being <coughs> change agents. I'm now looking at how you, imp how, how you implement. One of the problems that, in other words, I'm saying that the people you send out to do this good work can't just be cops or academics or anybody else. 
They need to be people who have actually had some experience in changing organizations, in mentoring people in organizations to do differently, who have trained people in the past. And what we do constantly in the United States and other places too, I must say, uh, we keep sending out people who have a certain status in law enforcement, but they don't know anything about teaching, managing, mentoring, overseeing, and so forth. Uh, and we have to begin to select the people that we deploy abroad for these skills, and not simply because of the fact that they know how to write a constitution, or they know how to, how to organize a, a traffic police. They've got to be people who can interrelate with the people that they are trying to change in a way which is accepted. This is a unique skill. And we have in the United States done nothing virtually, sorry to be so dramatic here, but I get irritated from time to time. We have done nothing to work on, on figuring out what those skills are and selecting for them, and when they don't exist, putting people into a training program, for goodness sakes, on how you interact in that particular culture to achieve the objectives you want. The military is, DOD is beginning to get ahead of us in this, in big ways. They're doing much more effective things, I think, in terms of, of teaching people about the culture they're going into, the languages they're going to need, and they're beginning to feed back some of the skills or some of the problems that people in the field have encountered and what you've got to do so you don't encounter them again. The DOD is, is ahead of us, I think, on it. Okay, the civilian side. Um, seventh, Mike's point. We're going to focus on the police, but do understand that being successful in what you want to do in the police requires a, a, a larger context of change, having to do with the Ministry of the Interior, Ministry of Justice, whatever you want to call it, uh, and the rest of the criminal justice system. Uh, you can't just change the police and hope that that is going to achieve the good things that you want. Uh, and so what I say here, the implication of this is beware of stovepipes in development, and we do that all the time. Um, and we have one stovepipe that works on the cops, and we have another one that works on, you know, on the prosecutor, we have another one that works on this and that, and they don't communicate. And it's got to be a whole of government coordination. I think we're beginning to learn that, but bringing it off is hugely difficult. All right, now eight. Two, per notice I haven't talked anything about this particular problems of Africa, um, because I think these other ones come first, actually, before you get to the problems of Africa. Uh, there are two problems, overarching imperatives, I think, in creating in Africa the kind of police forces, the kind of police services, as the British like to say, uh, that I'm talking about. One that serves the public with the end of, of, of becoming legitimate in the eyes of the public and therefore legitimating uh, the government and the rule of law. Two big problems. One is to buffer uh, political intrusion into policing. Politicians will always try to get the police to do things. Always. It's true. Uh, look, I'm from New York State, for God's sake. <laughs> and we've just gone through three superintendents of police in about eight weeks for this very reason. So I do know something about this. Uh, and, and so what I'm saying is we've got to, you've got to develop some, some walls between what the police what the police can do with the police, I'm sorry, what the politicians can do with the police and what they can't do with the police. This is long term, it has its own problems and, and we could spend a lot of time on it, but especially in hiring, promoting, assigning and disciplining. The police have got to be on their own bottom on that one. Uh, we're talking about the kind of professionalization that came into American and British policing in the early part of the 20th century. It took us 50 years and we're still working on it, plainly as from what I've said but that's crucial. And the second thing is, as Mike has mentioned, is eliminating corruption. Uh, if you want to, in, in a word, what's the biggest delegitimator of a police force? It's being corrupt anywhere in the world. You have to pay for the service. Um, and this is true throughout Africa. Um, it's true in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and so forth. Uh, and by the way, the, the problem of political buffering and corruption are intimately related. If the police, for example, if the politicians sell posts, police posts, for example, and they do in many, many countries, uh, especially in India, which I know quite well, then the police people have to raise the money to pay the politician. How do you do that? And you, you begin to get a system of corruption. It's not personal failings. It's a system that's rooted in the structure of, of political supervision. All right. 
So those are the two problems that you are going to have in any program that you, if you launch in Africa. You're going to have to confront those uh, right off the bat. So these are my eight points about how you go about putting together a program that, that, that may work. And I'll end by simply saying this. I'm going to give you my test for what a, a reformed population-serving police looks like. In other words, how do, you, how do you judge whether you have achieved what you want to achieve in terms of this population-serving legitimate police force? My test is the following. We talk a lot about evaluating these programs. We never do. But here's my, my test. It's this. Do parents in the country which you are working in, do parents teach their children that when they're away from home and need help of any sort, they look for a cop? If the answer to that is yes, fine. That's a wonderful police force. If the answer to that is no, and it is no in about 90% of the world's countries, you have something to do. And I've tried this, this one, you know, this one-liner test on a lot of people in different countries, and I find that not only do civilians accept it, but so do the cops. The cops can't deny that this, that this is a fair test of what they're doing. They may hate it because they don't really want to do it, but they can't deny it. And I find that this is a, you know, if I can get them nodding, that that's, that's a legitimate thing to require of us, I've turned a corner. A small one, but it's a corner. All right, thank you very much. Gosh, um, thank you both for really excellent, thoughtful presentations on that. Um, the question it raises for me um, in terms of getting, kind of changing attitudes, changing culture almost, the policing culture, and, and getting that kind of written policy right is who, who's going to do that and what will be the driver of that? Um, you know, there's, there's reasons probably that the police are so under-resourced and kind of the poor, poor brother of the militaries. They probably don't pose the same kind of threat to the regime that a military might, so the military gets privileged in, in, in those ways. Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering if, from your experiences, where you might have seen that culture begin to change and what drove it. Because it seems it, it, it's going to require more than kind of engaging at the state to state level, but will probably come from movements within society more. I mean, I'm thinking of the Kenya case recently, uh, kind of in the, the performance of the police after the elections, really drove, I think, I mean, it's, I think Kenyans have always acknowledged that there's a problem there, but this really put a spotlight in in a certain way that I think a lot more groups are, are becoming focused on it. Nigeria, the recent Boko Haram incident, I think has um, kind of stirred up some opportunity, well, I'm not going to say opportunities for reform, but a debate on, on this. But have you seen it, have you seen that kind of shift happen? You say it happened here in the early 20th century in some ways, and it's still a work in progress, but, and what, what drives that change ultimately? Is it just a leadership question, or is it a community well, I'll, question? Well, I think, first of all, just in terms of Nigeria, there's actually a lot of debate that's been going on for quite a while in Nigeria about policing. I mean, I, I was at a police account. I ran internal affairs at LAPD for about three years. And I was at a police uh, civilian accountability meeting in The Hague. And, you know, there was a whole contingent from Nigeria, not from the police, but from civilian oversight bodies and people working on it. I mean, so th there's a pretty robust discussion going on. Now, what, what that's ultimately coming to, I don't know. I think David's point, though, is exactly right. What does, what does the host government want? And so the example I would use, just in my experience, is El Salvador. Me too. I, I think that El Salvador, following the war, there was a very firm agreement about what the police were going to be. 20% from the former government, 20% from the former guerrillas, 60% never been the police before. And all of the donor countries recognized that this was a long-term commitment. And we were there for years with the Spanish, with the Argentinians, with 
other countries very agreed upon in a very structured way, and by the way, we did a brilliant AID project on demilitarizing the guys. When the military police got pulled out, we, we put the new police in in segments. They trained up a whole contingent of folks, they went to a part of the country, they pulled out the military police and put in the new Police Civile Nationale, and um, those people, as they came out, you want to be a farmer, here's some land, here's, a, here's seed, here's a chit. You want to be a truck driver, here's a chit. Here's a, here's a, you want to be a computer guy, here's a chit to go to school. Um, so in my opinion, when you look back at El Salvador in the early 90s following the war, that would be my leading <coughs> example where there was a conscious, complete change. Now, we can have a, a whole different discussion about the effectiveness of the police or issues in the police. I'm not saying that they don't have those, but, but to answer your question, which is, change that would be my example now yeah that. i think there's one in africa and that's south africa now mm -hmm. and that's ongoing all of these are going to ongo police departments can relapse and don't ever forget that uh, absolutely uh, so it's always a work in progress but i think i think south africa has worked very hard on the attitudes of the, of the whole new uh, the whole new, whole new group of people who've been recruited uh since since mandela uh, basically uh, Northern and, Ireland. So that's the second one, I think. Uh, but <laughs> no, Mike and I are struggling. <laughs> you know, you know, despite all the places where the UN has been, all the places where, the, where America has been, all the training we've done, we're coming up with a couple, and they haven't, you know, they, they haven't quite got there as one might. Wait, let me say something else. For a long time, I, I took the notion that that. You see, the point is, if the government won't let you do it, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Forget it. Now, and so uh, my view has been for a long time, if the government won't let us do what we think is in their long-run interests, which I've talked to you about, <coughs> uh, and in the interest of the population, don't go. Don't go. Now, the problem with that is that we do have international security interests. And there are bureaucracies, powerful ones, in the U.S. government supported by people on the Hill for virtuous reasons that say, that's nice, Bailey, but we've got people coming in from, from, <clears throat> from uh, uh, Southeast Europe, for example, people trafficking out of the former republics of the Soviet Union, parts of the Soviet Union. We've got to work with these people, even if, we're, even if they're not interested in what you might call democratic police. We may, <clears throat> excuse me. We've made pacts like this with, with, with uh, uh, South American regimes in the past. Uh, and so this is going to be a, uh, back to what I said at the beginning, there are going to be some places where you simply can't do some, the agenda that you would most like to do. And do you just simply say, okay, we're not going, or do you go in a kind of a, in a gradual way <coughs> and try to use that leverage to move them in the long run in the direction that you want to go. This is the art of doing foreign aid. <coughs> can I? Can I, I, I I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jennifer. Okay. Shella is moved to speak. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think the point that you just made is absolutely the right one because my observations say to me that uh, politicians will always strive to accomplish their objectives. In Nigeria, which is the case that I know best, the police was deliberately downplayed in the 70s uh, to shore up the military. And that situation continues to exist up until today. Uh, and the, the current politicians are trying very hard to continue to dominate the police. State governors are calling for state police so that they can continue that domination. Uh, where I violently agree with you is the fact that it's going to be difficult for the U.S. to get the objective of those governments changed. It's going to be very difficult. Therefore, you go in with the attitude, look, there are international issues uh, that we need to deal with. But because we need the police to be of service to the people <coughs> to create a stable environment so that those international problems can be dealt with longer term, I think that's where you start from. Can, can, I, can I have one observation about, the, about what David said? 
It's interesting, we draw, the U.S. draws a very big distinction between <coughs> military assistance and police assistance. And, and I remember when I was living in Kenya and commuting into Somalia for a while, we weren't allowed to do any support for the Kenyan police or do the gradual change that you're describing. But there was a whole floor of the embassy that was U.S. military assistance. Um, and so we, we've, we, we've not had that kind of discussion on the police side. And I will make one other point that we have to keep in mind, and we all know this. We don't have a federal police force in the United States. We don't have a national police force. And so unlike, you know, Canada says, okay, we'll send the RCMP and the Garda Shikanas, you know, the Ireland sends them. We don't have one of those. And so that, you know, America's greatest strength in policing in some ways is the diversity of the police forces and the kind of experimentation that goes on. It's also our greatest weakness in a lot of ways. And, and it absolutely is a weakness in the broader international context. And may I just say one thing? And we are going to start crying. Um, because we don't have a national police force, we have several federal agencies, and all of them have special, they have special remits. And they are not the kind of agencies which can do the kind of attitudinal transformation training that we want. It's Mike's police forces. Uh, it's the state and local police forces that know how to do the reform that I'm talking about. But the ones that we can dispatch are the feds. Bless them. They know a lot of things and they're doing some good work. I mean, don't get me wrong here. But their institutional charge is not the same as that Mike had in L.A. <clears throat> okay, I have questions on that, but let's, let's go to David Um It's a story rather than a question. Maybe um, use your mic if you could. Yeah. Uh, hello. Yes. It's a story rather than a question. Um, with some observations. Uh, I spent quite a lot of time in Sierra Leone, and the British government has poured vast resources into rebuilding Sierra Leone since the end of the war in 2002. And one of the things they've done is to reconstruct the police force. So 2002, I could go to parts of Sierra Leone I'd never been to before, and every police station was more or less rebuilt, and every police station had a shiny new Land Rover sat outside it. I had my computer stolen, and so I went to report it to the local police. And it was a tremendously hierarchical structure, because the chief police officer of the town of Bo wasn't actually there. It was a Sunday that I went. Uh, nobody had the authority to do anything, even take down a basic report, uh, that there was such a sense of hierarchical structure within the local police that even the senior detective didn't feel able to deal with this European who'd come in. Uh, and, and that you know, everything would have to wait until the boss was in place, let alone the guy down at the bottom. Um, and it's, it strikes me that in a society which is so hierarchical, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult, even if they have the resources, to actually instill the initiative and the, you know, the, the sort of independence go-getting uh, that, in a sense, uh, is essential to any kind of police work. When they actually came to my hotel to take the details, about five detectives came. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they took down the, the report. And the first thing they did immediately was to uh, uh, arrest all the hotel maids because they were people with key in, access to the rooms. And so they were all immediately thrown into jail for a weekend just to see you know, what was happening. They know evidence against them. Now, by this time, I was getting more and more alarmed about what I had instigated. Um, finally, I wanted to uh, get a signed piece of paper from the police so that I could present it to my insurance company when I came back home. 
it was again impossible for any of the junior officers in Bow Police Station, and we're not talking about some secondary town, we're talking about the second major city of Sierra Leone with a population of more than a quarter of a million. Again, nobody had the authority to do anything unless the chief of police signed it. Uh, and, and so, you know, we're talking about a society whose social assumptions are so different that even with all the changes that you've talked about, it seems to me fundamentally virtually impossible to instill uh, an American or European style sense of policing. It just doesn't work like that. And how you actually create that, I don't know. In Kenya, by contrast, you go into the police station, you say, I've been burgled. Everything is taken down, everything is done. The problem is the police don't have a Land Rover to do anything. Um, so in, in Kenya, you have the initiative, you have the drive, but you don't have the facility. In Sierra Leone, because of British money, you did have the facility, but you had no initiative and structure and, 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 and sense of how to actually operate as a real police force. Let me just one, question. one quick comment. We can start crying because of the inadequacies of the American government. We can start crying because of the impediments that we'll face abroad. They're all true. And once we begin to list them, we'll all go home and we'll say, hey, this is a, a failing enterprise. If I were a betting man, I would always bet nine to one against reform working in any of the places that we're working in. I, I, think, that, I think it's that difficult for, for the reasons that you begin to point to. Does that mean we should stay home? I don't think so. I think we have to try and try again, and we have to become more skilled. And I think we have not been as skilled as we need to in the United States. Look, it took the British and the Americans at least a century of reform before they institutionalized some of the things that we think characterize our police force. It's going to take a long time. So let's, so let's just accept up front that this is going to fail more times, certainly in the short run, then it, then it succeeds. I'll put an exclamation point on that. Until 1993, police chiefs in America didn't talk about crime. Until 1993, we didn't talk about reducing crime. That was never discussed by police chiefs. It was only in 1993 when we started doing ComStat and we started taking ownership and accountability for crime that we started really driving down crime numbers and started to tailor responses, in David's word, to the realities that we were facing. But that was 1993, 94. That's when it started. But how do you dig it down? Well, I think you've got other... Everything you suggested is the sort of surface. How do you get down to the bottom? We've got more sessions coming. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, Eric Beinhardt from uh, ISITAP and AID, actually. Um, uh, what I think we're, we, we really need to look at carefully when we talk about Sub-Saharan Africa is the, the chasm between urban and rural. Um, you guys have brought it out uh, some, but I think a lot of times we're naive when we go in and we're talking about rule of law development. Um, and, and if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we're looking at the capital city. What about the rest of the country? I mean, a lot of these countries in Africa, the, the rural areas have never had a colonial, a statutory colonial system. So how are we going to create one? The people don't read. They don't read the colonial language. Um, they, there's thousands of languages in Africa. You have all these issues, which I think we're naive in not addressing. And, and Dr. Bailey, you mentioned uh, civic education, basically, I think is what you were, were getting at. But I mean, civic education, how do you link the customary law with statutory law? How do you build bridges between the two? Because honestly, I think if, if we talk about uh, rule of law development in Africa, we're talking about a very, it depends on who's defining rule of law and in what context. And I think a lot of what happens in Africa is you have an, an urban elite, which obviously has uh, sort of our rule of law conception, but the rest of the country does not have that. So how do you start narrowing that gap. Yeah, that's something that I, that I wrestle a lot with when working on Africa. Nice to see you, Eric. I, I think, but I think it varies by country. Again, like Somalia, when we did the ISITAP project in Somalia, 
they had police stations in all the sub towns. And where we worked the best actually was the sub towns, Mogadishu, we had the most trouble. Um, so I think, again, it's very situational. I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to your law question. I mean, I've wrestled with that over and over again. Um, and, I, you know, I, I saw it in Afghanistan in December. You know, it's the, it's the Islamic government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. You know, we, we've got to figure out how to do that. But I think the, the rural-urban question is very situational. I'm not sure it's... Um, I'm not sure I would just say, because I, you know, well, in Kenya, you've got... Yeah, to, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to generalize it. I, I just, I think from a development perspective, we don't analyze it enough. And, and I think in my experience working on law enforcement, criminal justice development in Africa, is something the donor community does not look at enough. I, I, I guess agree. maybe that's a little... Uh, and, and let me just throw out one other pet peeve of mine. Um, you, you mentioned the, uh, some of the, the issues with host countries in terms of uh, you know, lack of political will. Um, the donor community needs to take a hard look at, at, at itself. Um, and, and I don't mean to pick on the UN, but I'm going to tell this little story. Um, in Nigeria in 2000, someone from the UN told President Abbasanjo that the ideal ratio of police to citizens was 1 to 400. Um, I don't know where they came up with that, but they came up with it. So President Obasanjo took that literally. Um, at the time, Nigeria had between 100 and 150,000 police. No one knew how many. There were a lot of people, ghost policemen, etc. But he decided to literally meet that ratio. So over the next four years, the Nigeria police force increased to 350,000 police, which is what it basically is today. It's more corrupt, it's more uh, incompetent, it's, it's everything. They still don't perform services that, that police normally would. They have vigilante groups who go out and, and do patrols. So I've seen this in various countries in the last year that I've gone to. Um, there's a document that says, well, the police force of X country is 15,000. Uh, in order to have an effective police force, we need to double it to 30,000 to meet the ratio of 1 to 400. So I think we, the donor community needs to take, take a long look at what we're doing and, and reassess. Uh, Let's take a, uh, the gentleman there and then Eric. I'm uh, Tyler Thompson from the Public International Law and Policy Group. Um, my question goes back to the hierarchy of needs that you were talking about in the very beginning. Um, and just what type of essential, minimal infrastructures are needed to even begin this reform process? Um, from what you were saying, it seems like food stability, communication, transportation, and prison structures, at the very least, are needed to even begin the reform process. So could you just say a few others? Yeah, you're talking about, I was talking about, you've got to do something on employee welfare. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, if I'm going to ask police officers to go out and do, do uh, certain jobs, take certain risks, serve the public, I'll, I'll endorse everything that David said 100%, serve the public, that kind of focus, um, then, then I've got to get to some basic level of employee welfare, employee wellness. Um, I, I think that depending on the country, you know, the Latin American model, which you see in a lot of Latin American countries where there's a barracks and there's housing provided and there's food provided for the police, is a very, very realistic way to go versus, you know, the U.S. model or a Western European model where it's live on the economy. We're going to pay you a salary and you're going to live on the economy. But that depends on the, on the context you're in. But you've got to at least get the police to some level where they can operate. And part of what Eric's talking about when you get to this question of how many cops, there's only so much money in the pie, right? And, and, and so one of my big arguments in Afghanistan is exactly, why are we trying to build a, a force of 100,000 or 90,000? Let's stop, let's build a really good force of 30,000 that we can pay, that we can equip, that we can deploy. Let's build the sustainable operational force. So I think when you have that discussion about employee welfare that you know people are going to make sure that it's like look look at the united states when you have natural disasters hurricane andrew hurricane katrina you know cops abandoned uh their post if their families weren't safe 
wh why would we expect anybody anywhere else to act any differently? So you've got to have a level of employee welfare wherever you are, and that was the point that I was trying to make. Before you start talking about all the great things you want the police department to do, um, taking the reports when somebody shows up and says, my computer was stolen, not arresting the maids. You, you know, before you get there, they've got to at least feel that they're, they can live. <coughs> Uh, okay. Two at once or okay. Two yeah. Uh, thanks. I, I, both present. Uh, I'm Eric Silla from Department of State. I work as a policy advisor for our Assistant Secretary. So I think about some of these bigger. Which which issues. Assistant Secretary? Uh, for Africa, Africa okay. Affairs. Okay. Great. Carson. Just uh, and I'm a historian by by training, graduate training. So I appreciate uh, both of your uh, uh, bows to to the importance of understanding history. And, and I think the presentations are so excellent that I think there's a lot of parallels to other, other sectors. And so this is sort of a suggestion or an idea that to put forth uh, for Jennifer and, uh, you know, as we roll forward. I think we're going to need to step back and look at sort of our bigger kind of strategic engagement uh, in Africa to figure out how this piece fits in because it, you know, any time we talk about some of our current uh, policy priorities, say promoting uh, economic growth and development investment, it loops back to uh, rule of law. And you know, every day there's some some new case of uh, you know a, a company investor dealing with a rule of law uh, issue in, in, in a given Af you know African country. But it also gets to the heart of the the fabric of Afri you know power in African states and society. And how do you uh, remake that, and then uh, also our, you know, our, mil our military uh, approach, which is, you know, at the moment, uh, we tend to overemphasize, I think as it was noted, the, the kind of the military approach, and so there's this kind of uh, formula for state building in Africa, which is based on uh, building capacity of the military, peacekeeping training, uh, and all these different uh, sectoral, uh, mo you know, mod modules. But the I think the bigger strategic challenge is, though, that when you look at how the resources allocated, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, well, I w wanted to ask earlier how much we spent on El Salvador, you know, uh, 20 years ago, uh, and what that would represent in today's dollars, uh, and how, you know, how that compares to our overall, uh, you know, uh, money that we're devoting to Africa. But also in terms of how that's balanced out, where we're spending billions of dollars say, on, on the PEPFAR um, and uh, malaria projects, uh, comparable amounts of money for supporting peacekeeping across Africa, and then if we look at what we're spending on on specific, you know, p uh, police programs. And so there's, I think, uh, at some point, in, as we have these discussions, we need to sit down and kind of figure out how these these uh, pieces uh, fit in. Uh, and I'll just close with kind of a historical comment. I mean, I think that, you know, when I studied African history, it was you know, the, the police, government institutions were built for the colonial powers. And I think there, there's that legacy there where, uh, to this day, uh, these institutions, whether they're judicial, uh, uh, law enforcement, are there for uh, almost kind of alien uh, uh, political uh, interests. I mean, they're not colonial today, but I think in many ways the relationship between a lot of governments and their people is still very much kind of a colonial uh, colonial one. Thanks, Eric. Um, I think that is important. Um, and, you know, I hope that we, we can do that and kind of uh, where this fits into the biggest picture because we don't want to look at uh, the issue of policing in a vacuum. And also what you said, a kind of a pet fire in that approach, um, and I wonder in the sequencing of this, because in, in PEPFAR, it was, it's very hard to get governments, for example, to start thinking about rebuilding their health systems if there's nothing passing through the health system. I mean, there, was no, there were no drugs or meds or, and so forth. Um, and so to, to, to kind of push for a cultural change before we begin to do kind of the nuts and bolts stuff in capacities, I wonder if there is a balance there, that you begin to do things that then can incentivize um, greater reform change. I mean, or in the maritime security, if, you know, get, if everyone will say, yes, it's important, but, you know, we don't even have a, a, a Coast Guard cutter or yeah. a port. Or, um, but if you start to perhaps say, you know, 
European Command is big on the AIS systems, you know, the things that you stick on the Mac, so the, yeah. or, you know, or a computer or kind of basic technical capacities, then says to the government, okay, there may be something here in it for us to start going down this route. But otherwise, it, it kind of goes against what you're saying, get the culture change first, but how do you do that if there's kind of nothing People are stuck in what the reality is. No, I don't. No, I don't violently disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're putting two things together, uh, 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 putting two things together that should not be put together, and that is you 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 may have to bribe foreign governments to get access to do what you want. You may have to give them some things that they're going to want that they may not use, indeed, in the way that you want to use them. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to have to so do that. That's what. And that's what. And, and let me. And let me say that's what you do. You see, you ultimately, whether you're doing pol uh, political reform or, or police reform abroad or in the United States, it's ultimately it, it comes back to politics. It is. It is a high political matter, and you have to understand that at the beginning, not at the end. So that's what I say to that. You're going to have to do this, and you and State Department is going to have to be the ones that kind of balances those priorities. Okay. On the other hand, I don't like the thinking when you begin to talk about the police reform process itself as if there are, I don't like the word balancing. What we do too often in the United States is what we say is we'll stick in these things and presumptuously this will get us to where we want to go in terms of police reform. And what I'm, what I'm saying is, once you get onto the politics of this thing, what your objectives are in that particular country, you should then figure out how you should say to get to, let's say we want to get to attitudinal change, which I want to do. What do you need to do to get there? In other words, always make sure that your inputs are contributing to the objectives that you've stated. Too often in the United States, we, we just deploy inputs with no theoretical, empirical connection to where we want to go in the long run. That's what I'm saying. And that's why I, I, I quarrel with you about the balancing notion that you put certain things in first and then, oh gosh, now good things will happen. Uh-uh. I wish it were that way. Uh, and so what I'm saying is always make sure that in your strategic plan, you keep your eye fixed on where you want to go and you justify every input in terms of that objective. You know, I, I understand the, the I, th I think your point is well taken. I, I, the only thing I was thinking about when you were talking about it, I was thinking about Haiti. When we first went into Haiti to create the first ever civilian police force, we, we were really started on how do we, you know, nobody went to the police station in Haiti. It's, it's sort of David's point, you know, if you went to the police station in Haiti, you immediately got beat up and locked in a cell for a couple of days to teach you never to come there and bother them again. <laughs> and, and so how do we change the population's view about the police? That was, you know, the issue we were wrestling with in 94 and 95. And, and it was interesting because there was a lot of pressure, you know, that we, we were trying to make, how do we make them responsive? Well, at that point in time in Haiti, only 2% of the population had telephones. So you can't have the U.S. model of, you know, dial 911 because there's no phones. Um, and we had to think about other ways. And it was interesting, the technology, so, so there was nothing passing through the system. But then cell phones came along and we completely bypassed the need for that, so so there there can be this interplay, I guess, between it. I I tend to agree with David, though, and I I think it's a difficult, it's an easy position for us to say, sitting here in a conference room talking about it in the abstract, you know, you must have the politics right. It gets really messy and really hard when you're at the table and you're trying to get it done and you're dealing with all these other countries and all these other factors and Congress and I, so I, I I endorse his comment 100 percent. But I, I also, having been the guy on the ground a lot, I, I, I've seen how difficult that can be. And at, at the time when we were getting pressure to address these transnational Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, that's, exactly. that's what yeah. But then the dilemma is, what then do you do? But, but the bottom line is that policing is not front and center in the current discourse on policy. You're, or you're absolutely it's, right. It's, it's just not true. true. And, it, and, so, and it needs to be. Yeah. I completely agree. We don't have a we don't have a federal police force. Who's the voice? You know, I think it 
could be, should be, wish it was ISATAP, but that's another, that's a long discussion. We have, I'm going to run out okay. in a minute. I'm, um, I'll stay for another minute or two, okay, and then I, I, you'll have to excuse me. I'm sorry. I must go. Okay. Well, you, if you, we'll go I'll a little over, finally. but let's take two quick questions. The gentleman here has been waiting, the gentleman in the back. Very quick, and then if you have to run, you have to run your Adolfo Agbogan from African Competition. Okay. I would like to know how do you assess the, if you, you go to uh, a country like in Africa, how do you assess the existing culture before you transfer your Western country policing knowledge to the police department of a particular country? How do you do that? And second, I would like to respond to my friend who have, uh, my colleague that have experience in Sierra Leone. Uh, it will depend on the year or the particular time because Sierra Leone have war and many many police officers has been gone and then replaced. So it depends the time you went there. But uh, if I want, to, uh, as a former police officer in Secret Service from Togo, I have a little bit of experience about condition that you happen or things that happen to you, or why you see that difference. First of all, if you left your culture from where you are from, you may not see any difference. That's how they operate their police job in that particular country. But it's because you're comparing that behavior, police behavior to your country, police officers' behavior, then everything becomes uh, weird for you. And that's what both speakers talk about, culture. We're going to have to cut. OK. Uh, wait, quick question from the back. Hi, Eric Gutches from Human Rights Watch. I just had a quick question on police corruption. If there's any cases of like success stories on dealing with police corruption, whether it be historically within U.S. For police forces or country national forces, and any specific uh, strategies that you found worked, again, dealing with high-level grant corruption or petty corruption uh, extortion. God, there's huge. There's a huge body of success stories. I mean, uh, both in the U.S. and abroad. You know, I mean, we could sort of. You, you could talk about the LAPD and uh, coming out of the Rampart case. You could talk about New Orleans. Now, New Orleans is a great example because it goes back to the point that Dr. Bailey made. Those issues were fixed. There was a lot of fix going on in the in the uh, early 2000s, and now today, uh, a lot of problems have resurfaced. So it goes to a central point in American policing anyway. We're too leadership-centric. Uh, we don't have a teaching hospital uh, approach to policing. But I think there are lots of, uh, there are, internationally there have also been lots of experiences. Again, uh, Peru, for example, has done some very interesting things with traffic uh, corruption where, for example, the traffic police in Peru are all women um, they're driving the motorcycles because they decided that they would have less corruption with female traffic cops than with males. So, you know, there's been a lot of stuff. There's a, that's, a, there, that's a very rich body of knowledge, and there is a, a pretty well-developed uh, doctrine around what to do. I will say, and I'll, this is my opinion, I'll be happy to debate this at long length, um, I, I am not a fan of the current efforts on civilian oversight and accountability, particularly the methodology the Brits have taken with the Independent Police Complaints Commission. I, I will predict to you that because we haven't done what David Bailey said we needed to do, which is what's the objective, that in five to six years they're going to be trying to change that because they haven't defined what success is. I, I'm a complete fan of transparency, of oversight. The police need to belong to the public and be accountable to the public, but the mechanisms that I'm seeing develop around the world where somehow you substitute a civilian investigator for a police investigator, or the idea that the police cannot investigate themselves is frankly repugnant to me and, is, and does not reflect the reality that I found. Can I say something about culture? Yeah. Yeah. Mike. I'll talk to you soon, brother. Take care. Thank you very much. Mike, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I've got to run. I want to say something about his, his comment about culture. Um, I don't think you so much were looking at changing cultures. We need to adapt to cultures. And when you send in your assessment team, you don't just send in police officers and lawyers 
you send in some people who know something about the local country, uh, the local country and culture. In other words, you need area experts. You need social scientists. You need people who are sensitive to that, so that at least they can then guide you into what you can use locally, and what you need to change. And often, I think you you don't need to change as much as you think. That many of the things that we're talking about in local cultures. Well, let me put it another way. I think most people around the world, I don't care whether you're in rural areas or capital areas or whether you're in Africa or, or Asia, most people want to have, when they're threatened in some way physically, they want to be able to go someplace that is reliable, that will take them seriously and will not treat them on the basis of their skin color or their gender. Or I think this is universal. Am I wrong? And, and, and in fact, in places like Africa, there are all sorts of traditional auspices which people will go to when the state fails, right? And what and, and, you, and you simply have to ask yourself the question, what are these local what do these local bodies, as long as they're not, you know, kind of exclusive bodies as they may be on the basis of religion or whatever, what is it that they give that the government isn't? And I be, I bet you they're talking about what I'm talking about. They're talking about people you can rely on to be effective and fair. must end there. Um, thank you very much. I'm sorry that we went a couple of minutes over. Um, it has been great to have you here. Um, yeah, it was good points which I think uh, we will certainly keep in mind and I think the questions you raised are ones that are going to be very rich and poor over the next uh, months. Um, we will, we will, our next session will probably be in late April, early May. We're going to try to get um, uh, Charles Snyder and from State Department here to talk about State Department's role, and we'll be um, we'll be have a rolling series um, over the next few months.